Welcome, welcome. We are back for another episode of The Lock-In. I'm David Lappin and I am joined by Irish Open 47th place finisher Dara O'Kearney. Dara, not only did you make a deep run in the main, but you also cashed in the seniors and the mystery bounty, pulling one of the big bounties along the way, I know. Yeah, it's nice to finally achieve a finishing position in the Irish Open that's a smaller number than my age. Um, it's the first time I've done it in my life. Uh the mystery bounty was just the weirdest tournament ever because I literally max late reg that two minutes after busting the main. So not exactly the best mindset. Spent um <laughs> spent five hours in the tournament and uh got my second biggest score of the year uh um overall. Um uh, and yeah, cash to under seniors. Um I, I think we talked on the show before about how I started with a really bad record in seniors. Um, but actually my lifetime record now is fairly phenomenal. I've cashed by my account, 75% of the seniors tournaments I've played. Wow. So, wow. Nothing wow. remarkable there about catching seniors. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> insane, all right. Well, we're going to talk a lot more about the Irish Open, just gone. What a spectacular festival, i got to say, it was in Dublin. Helping us to do that is one of Ireland's young guns, something of a mystery bounty specialist himself, and a terrific commentator too. He joined Darren, myself, and James Hardigan in the booth last week. He also came 12th in the Irish Open in 2023. He is Thomas Murphy. Thomas, welcome to the lock-in. Yeah, thanks very much for having me on the lock-in. And uh, you're far too kind. You're making my accolades sound phenomenal. <laughs> no, no, all real things that happened to you. Uh, let's kick things off by chatting maybe about the Irish Open. Extraordinary numbers, first up. Uh, 3,233 entrants, to be exact, across the, the four starting flights. Those numbers are up roughly 25% from last year, Boyd. I know by uh, 900 satellite qualifiers, actually 900 online satellite qualifiers, I'm sure there were more live ones too. I think that was 500 from Stars, 200 from Paddy, and another 200 from various eye poker skins. The huge uptake on satellites, Dara, I wrote in my article that this was proof in the pudding that choosing a win as many as you like model is greater for satellite liquidity and therefore really good for generating the maximum number of seats. A few people did push back to me, though, asking me to explain that, to lay out why it's so. And I thought maybe you could make the liquidity argument now for me. Yeah, I, 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 I mean, it is a matter of liquidity. You, you want these satellites to run. The reason why satellites died on stars back in the day is they switched to a, you can only qualify once for every event. And what happened then was, first of all, you know, People who wanted to play the event would play would play a few satellites that qualify, and then they're not in the satellites anymore. So every every night, a few more people were dropping out to the point where the satellite just wouldn't start. And then, if a satellite doesn't start, you know, if a recreational logs on on a Tuesday or a Wednesday to play a satellite because they have they have a free night, and the satellite doesn't start, and they come back again the next day, and the satellite still doesn't start, they're pretty much going to just give up and assume that the, these satellites never run. Um, the other thing was once they switched to that model, like I stopped trying to qualify for a lot of tournaments that I would have otherwise gone to. So it, it even affects the numbers in the tournament itself. Um, the reason why I, I used to play every single UK IPT stop was I could generally win 12 or 13 seats to it. So I was in profit before I even went to the stop. Once they took away that, I was like, well, I'm not going to make any special efforts to uh, to to qualify for a uh, a, a 1k in Coventry or wherever nothing against Coventry but like it's just not worth traveling uh the, the whole model changes so long as they had a hard core of people who were playing the satellites every night the the satellite grinders and they actually incentivized it the first two years with the leaderboard um that meant that they could more or less guarantee the satellites were running whereas okay the Irish Open didn't struggle this year because the Irish Open is a phenomenon in itself but lots of other uh, satellites and stars even this year just don't get the numbers necessary to run I love how you threw out there Coventry and then almost reacted like you, you you could imagine somebody you knew from Coventry who was very threatening and 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 made you take that back immediately. <laughs> uh, Thomas, I said in my article how it was almost the perfect festival. I thought the off the table festivities were spot on. Lots of crack in the crack den and other bars. Uh, I thought the main event structure was good, except I would tinker with the stack um, and levels to make the early levels a bit more meaningful and then that would kind of in turn give a little bit more play to the later levels of day one when they're probably more necessary. They are very tiny points, though. Uh, I thought the rake was about 2% too high across the board. A lot of people did grumble about the the sort of, yeah, a little bit egregious rake. And I thought that the championship side event should play to a final table on day one. 
and then finish out the next day. That was an argument I I, I made to a, a, anyone I could find, actually, because I just think that's a no brainer now that they're getting such big numbers on those side events. What are your thoughts about what I just said there? And also, if you have any other ideas or changes you would implement? Yeah, uh, first and foremost, I would like to say fair play to JP, as I did, as we know, last year was my first Irish Open. So, you know, I can't really go far back in this archive of, oh, the times in the City West were unbelievable. I am very much familiar with just the venue of the RDS. And I did have a great time at the uh, Irish Open last year, maybe a bit biased based on results, but <laughs> it, it was really good, really unique, tons of fun, regardless of results. Same as this year as well. You know, I didn't have as well as an Irish Open this year as I did the year before, but a heap of fun. And one thing I will say to JP's credit is that he did take your advice from previous year's article on very well. He did take it on board very well. He did make these changes. The tournament structure changed. Uh, they had Irish commentators in the booth. It felt a lot more Irish on the stream. Uh, as for points this year, like I would entirely agree with you on two. One thing I did notice myself is, and you will see this at other Irish uh, Irish stops as well but the rake yeah maybe just a couple of percent too high and a lot of people did exactly have a comment on that and that's fair like I understand there it is a very high quality event uh there's I guess a lot of mouths to feed at the event but I do think you could get away with lowering the percent uh, a couple and then also your idea of I I I think as you mentioned in your article as well this is a win-win having the final table of side events or other events on a separate day giving those last it doesn't even have to be the final table of like maybe it could be the final six even right i think i think maybe some wpt events do stuff like that as well where they have yeah. the final table on a different day and if you've just played like poker seems to be only one of those seems to be one of the only kind of things that you have a 12 hour day a 16 hour day and it's expected as almost normal you know but you're playing for thousands of euro up top there's six people left you're drained. You've already been playing for 14 hours. You wouldn't be bad to have a break, you know, get a good sleep, text your family, build a bit of a sweat for the event, have a separate area where it, it isn't going to take a lot of space, right? Like you only need a theater, one table, one small area to cut off and, you know, build a small kind of rail, people having drinks on the rail, being there to sweat their friend, potentially bring home a great payday and a trophy from the Irish Open. So I, I definitely think that's a huge benefit. So I think the two huge takeaways would be the, the rake and the final table for me. Very good. Well, as I said, and as you mentioned as well, the three of us did some uh, commentary in the booth and uh, weren't the only Irish voices, which was great. Uh, last year, one of our criticisms and very much that of the community was uh, that there wasn't enough of that. So it was great to see stars showing some generosity in that regard. Apart from us, Colm Chan, Porrick O'Neill and Fintan Han put in stints, as did former Irish Open winners Griffin Benger. And David Doherty, Joe Stapleton, unfortunately got a bit of a tummy bug. Otherwise, I'm sure we would have heard a lot more from him. But huge kudos, actually, to Irish passport holder James Hartigan, who did Trojan work in the anchor slot all week. Uh, not the easiest role, pretty much ever present in the booth. Um, and just like gave space to all the Irish voices, I thought, really well when they came in. Uh, sort of, you know, di didn't feel the need to, to do too much uh, chat and let the other people sort of speak up and then, you know, occasionally bring things back to the action or do his, you know, in and out anchor role, which, are, you know, he's obviously brilliant at. Dara, what did you think of the coverage this year? And what has the feedback been like, actually, from players who are listening? Because obviously being there at the event, you're not necessarily also tuning in. Yeah, I have to admit, I, I haven't heard a single minute of the of the coverage yet. Um, it's been a running joke in the Irish Open that one of the reasons why I used to do so much commentary, I was uh, I was generally the first well-known player to be eliminated, and then that freed me up back in the days when it was a freeze out. This time I was actually fully occupied. As I said, I went straight from the Irish Open to the to the mystery bounty, <clears throat> and then on the last day I was uh, I was uh, busy cashing the seniors until the the event was over. So I only did a short stint with Thomas at the end of the second last day after I. Uh, bust the mystery bounty but the from what i gather the feedback has been tremendous um there's been none of the negative comment or at least i haven't seen any a lot of people send me messages saying how much they enjoyed uh tom o column you um and and portugal in the box as well so i think you know it's good that they addressed the criticism that uh the, that, that was raised last year it, di it did definitely leave a bad taste in the mouth last year that they it, it, it basically felt just like another stars event with a bunch of players they didn't know because they didn't know the Irish poker scene. Um, so yeah, overall, I think the, uh, the, 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 the commentary this year was, was very, very good. And, and presumably that will be the model going forward. Just try and get as many Irish guests in as possible. Um, and <clears throat> completely back up what you say about Hartigan. Hartigan did an amazing job 
Um, it seemed the others were getting sick around him and he had to be, he, he, he was almost the last man standing on the deck of the Titanic. <laughs> well, Tomo, I got to say, you are a bit of a revelation for me in the booth. You, you did several frames at the IPO, the Unibet sponsored IPO um, on the live stream commentary in the Bonington last year. And you were just as good, if not better, on the Irish Open, I thought. So I obviously got to share the boot with you, as did Dara. Is commentary something you always wanted to do? Uh, it wouldn't exactly be. It's similar to poker, right? Like, I'm only doing poker, like, to last, I'd say, two and a half, come to three years. I'd never said, oh, poker is something I've always wanted to do. But since picking up this career, uh, like, I've always been... I think what actually did start, and what was so great about doing commentary at the Irish Open was that it's also now a poker star sponsored event. And I was always huge into watching all the EPT stops, watching old footage and did find that commentary would be something I, I thought I would enjoy to do. And after getting a taste for it at the IPO, uh, again, thank you for that opportunity. It was incredibly fun. Like I, I think Aiden Quinlan mentions it as well. Like it's just, it, it's a ton of fun being in the booth, especially if you're there with someone that you know or a friend and getting to commentate on plays. And uh, yeah, I, I just feel like ever since I've done it, it just kind of clicked and it, it, it's been nothing but fun. So and any highlights of that time? I think you might have done three frames, if I recall. Um, obviously, just, just, you know, just for our viewers who are unfamiliar with the technical terms that David uses, like everybody understands, a frame is like one session, one stint in the box, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get that out into the the general knowledge now. I keep saying that just so that people will eventually know that that's what that is. Um, in fairness, I only found this out about a year ago, so I like to overuse the term because I now finally know what it means. Um, but yeah, no, I'm just interested to know if there were any highlights of that for, for you, obviously, as a, a young player, a young voice in the game. It's really refreshing, I think, for the audience to, to hear what you have to say, but also just some raw talent there. Like, uh, you know, Darren and I often uh, pat ourselves on the back, having helped spot Henry Kilbane early in his, you know, commentary journey. And I, I, we say similar things about yourself. Oh, cheers. I appreciate it. That's really nice to be kind of held in a similar regard to Henry. Uh, but um, yeah, no, like in terms of highlights, it was just incredible to... I, I didn't get to do a stint with Griff, I think in total I'd done four hours, but shared it with Stapes and Hartigan. It was pretty surreal. Like it was almost weird. I remember on the first day of playing the Six Max, uh, Joe was sitting on a table behind me and hearing Joe's voice, you're like, it sounds strange to hear his voice, not <laughs> on YouTube. Or not on Twitch, you know what I mean? You're so used to hearing it there. But yeah, sharing, sharing the booth with them and then also like getting to do an hour stint with you, getting to do an hour stint with Dara. It, it was just pretty surreal to, at the time, totally enjoyed it. But look back afterwards and go, like, this is insane. I remember when I first started poker, I was like, oh, I'd love to be on uh, like a feature table or a poker stars feature table. And that happened last year with the Irish Open. And then, oh, like doing commentary for something like a, a gig as big as that would be really cool and got to have that opportunity this year. And like, it was also something that, again, didn't have the best week results wise, but looking back at stuff like that really makes it worthwhile and really makes poker enjoyable for me, like outside of the felt, so. Yeah, we were both saying how the next time it has to be a paid gig because uh, you've done your stints now uh, coming in as guest. And <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, look on the lookout, I hope some organizers maybe in Ireland or wherever else, uh, um, if they are looking for a young up and coming uh, voice in the game, I think you'd be great. You yeah, really would be great. great. Yeah. Um, Okie doke. Well, moving on. Well, actually, before um, we move on, David, I think we should talk about what for many people was the highlight of the Irish Open. And I unfortunately missed this, but um, you took down a very prestigious. <laughs> oh, yes. No, sorry. Yeah, don't brag about me away there, there. That's fine. Yeah, you. This was part of the Farad the leaderboard, uh, which uh, has to be said, you absolutely bossed. You you won the poker element. Then you won the horse betting element using game theory ap to absolutely wonderful uh, effect, much to the annoyance of your competitors, Spraggy, etc. Spraggy <laughs> called me a like... scumbag, but I did do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I, 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 I have to admit, I was a bit concerned for you in, in the karaoke contest because I've never heard you sing, and uh, you're not a man who likes to shy to hide his light under a bushel. So I just assumed you were absolutely terrible at it. I was very uh, blown away. Surprised. Blown away. Very pleasantly surprised when the footage emerged, and you actually, you were more or less the living embodiment of Shane McGowan. Uh, <laughs> you you pulled it off perfectly. You actually looked and sounded, uh, and you know seemed equally drunk as Shane was. Uh, yeah. At, at his peak, Kirsty McCall not quite so good, but but you know you gave it your all. You had confidence. You looked very cool on the stage. I I have to say I was blown away, and and so was Rob, your your best friend from outside poker. Uh, yeah. Rob very churlishly admitted that it was pretty good. 
Yeah, I, I was hoping we would we we wouldn't talk about the karaoke. We talk about my splitting of the G as a gluten intolerant person. I've been able to drink Guinness for the last fifteen years, but it absolutely smashed the G as well. So yeah, managed to 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 prove myself as an order. I did implore uh, you not to bring up the karaoke. Actually, now that I mentioned it, Dara, and I can only now assume you're in cahoots with uh, our editor, aka my Mrs. Sharon, to stitch in some footage of said karaoke. I did my best to suppress as much of it getting out as possible. I think I actually managed to keep all but the one uh, st- uh, like 30 second clip that you somehow got from Dave Curtis, who I assume got from someone else because he there's wasn't there. Two, there's actually two bit clips go- going around. There's, there's the one from Dave and, and also uh, uh, Benny Glazer uh, caught, caught 30 <laughs> seconds as well. Jesus. From, di- from a different angle. Okay, well, well I'm, gonna, I'm just going to keep talking as fast as I can here so there's no easy spot from which to cut in my performance. <laughs> I figure if I, if I don't stop to catch my breath, there'll be no clean way for any transition. <laughs> So looking at the results now from the Irish Open, friend of the show and uh, EPT champion, of course, Porrick O'Neill, came third in the 5K high roller, which was won by former guest poker stars Ambassador and Crystal met Santa Claus, Parker Tonka Talbot. Massive parlay in this one, it's got to be said, for Fergal O'Cahan, who got in through a 500 quid satellite the night before and took second for a career best 87,000 euros. Absolutely ridiculous result for him. The big one, however, was won by Finnish player Tero Lurila, who defeated Irishman Heap Nin heads up. Nin actually walked away with the lion's share of the prize pool, a 3.15 million prize pool, I should say, uh, after a three-way deal. Uh, They left something on the side to play for, but when it all was done and dusted, Nin got 335k. Lurila ended up with 296k in the title. And third place went to Mark Johnson, who got 233k. Rounding out the top five, Georges Sulaftas won 142k, while the popular local veteran Oli Boyce won 109k. One last story I want to bring up from the festival was a ruling, actually, and it's going to lead us into a couple of ruling stories. Um, I, this one made against friend of the show, Aidan Quinlan, who you brought up a moment ago uh, as well, Thomas. I'll give the story. It was the penultimate hand of day three. 14 players left and they were on a 5k pay jump. Aiden minned the cutoff uh, to 400k. Uh, He's playing 16 big blinds in this spot. The button playing 35 big blinds and covering everyone raises to nine big blinds, 1.8 million chips. To quote Aiden now, I tank and stare at Villain for about three minutes trying to range him I think about dynamics and decide that he would be applying max pressure with worse ace X and some king X. And maybe there's some flips in there too. So I decide to go with my hand, but I completely forget that the bet I'm facing is actually not an all in. I slam a chunk of chips in the middle saying, okay, let's go. And I table my hand. The floor says my hand is exposed with action pending. So my hand is still live, but I will have, and I will have all the options available to me. But of course the, the information is now given to his opponent. Um, with 1.425 million behind on this board, uh, Aiden felt like uh, he would have to go with his hand on a lot of boards. But the ensuing King 9 6 rainbow spooked him a little bit. He thought that wouldn't be one of the ones he should go with. After I gather myself, Aiden says, I decide I no longer have the equity needed to just rip this flop or something with the villain having perfect information. I check fold to a bet of 300k, deciding to try to spin up my last six big blinds. After the hand, Brandon, the TD, who Aiden insisted was very nice about it all, gave Aiden a one round penalty, forced him to sit out the last hand of the night. And then that gave Aiden an opportunity to escalate the matter to TD Sean, making the case that exposing his hand heads up was sort of punishment in itself. It was unintentional and he only damaged himself. The ruling was then downgraded to a three hand penalty decision, which I know Nick O'Hara and other senior TDs I've spoken to agree Dara, we spoke about this one right after it happened, actually, and I felt like it was a pretty harsh ruling you did, too, given the context. Now, obviously, it is a rule. So, you know, it's a rule for a reason. Your thoughts? Yeah, I think it's a harsh rule. I think I, I, I think it's an example where, 
you know, Brandon's a great uh, tournament director. He's absolutely world class. He's one of the get, get best guys at the WSOP. Um, I, I believe he doesn't do that anymore now. He has his own business. But nothing against Brandon. He, you know, he just enforced the rule. But I think when these rules are made, there should be a bit of, of leeway. Um, the reason why the rule is there is you don't want somebody to gain an, a, an advantage from showing their hand and, and getting to see their opponent's reaction. But in no world could you ever imagine that Aiden gets any advantage here. He's put in a huge chunk of his stack and now he's the still chips behind his opponent knows what his hand is. So he's unfortunate that the stage had happened at the tournament as well. Like scrutiny was obviously on with two, with two tables. There were a number of exposed hands that I heard about, and this was the only one that was penalized. Uh, one of my students uh, late on day one, um, he had been going after the blinds relentlessly because he had two tight players <clears throat> behind him when he was on the button. And this time he actually found a hand, uh, uh, pocket nines so when the blinds folded he showed his hand and then he was told that under the gun had raised already um so he his hand was now exposed now the under the gun player was very inexperienced and he just asked what do we do now so my student quickly said okay we just continue with the hand we'll continue with the hand you know my hand but you know that's that that's my fault the flop came six high and remarkably uh the other player checked folded to a bet so it, it it worked out very well. the 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 floor wasn't called. The theater didn't sh try to impose any penalty. There was another incident just before I bust where the player who I believe came third was at my table. He opened under the gun. Uh, he shoved under the gun. Sorry for fifteen or sixteen big blinds. A, a player in mid position with a big stack called, and then the other big stack at the table shoved from the big blind. And thinking the action uh, was over the player beside me exposed his hand, which is pocket tens. The dealer looked horrified and said, no, 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 no. I instinctively covered uh, the two cards with my hands so that the players couldn't see what they were. Neither, I, I don't think either player saw, saw the tens. The mid position player tank folded what he said was ace queen. The other guy had ace queen and the tens held up for a, for a full triple up and you know propel, propelled them all the way to third. Again, no floor was called, uh, no penalty was imposed. So it just seems that, you know, the, 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 there's luck and variance in these things too when you make your mistakes. Aiden is a recreational player, albeit a very serious one who takes the game as seriously, as, more seriously than most pros and, and, and studies very hard. But he's, but he's, you know, he's inexperienced. This was the biggest spot of his life. Um, a lot of pressure on him. Um, and yeah, I, th I think particularly with recreational players, more, you, sh you should be able to give leeway. When they make, when they make what's clearly a mistake, which doesn't give them any sort of advantage, then I think uh, you should be able to forego the penalty. Yeah, I think the other issue there as well is um, obviously there can be a collusory element where maybe you're playing against your mate and you don't want him to lose more chips and you could put the, that the show the hand so that you know he can he has perfect information and can respond. But clearly that's never this case. You know this is never what's going on in this situation. So again, discretion seems wise. Thomas, you're in the box with Dara. I know when this one went down, although I, I don't believe it went down on stream. What did you think when you heard it? Should there be more discretion like Dara says there? For example, I thought about this one actually when I put it to Nick O'Hara. The current metagame is to not shove in a lot of spots, but instead put the majority of your chips in and leave chips behind, maybe even leave a chip back. Mistakes like the one made by Aiden could therefore be induced by people doing things like that. And then it would seem really wrong that you could almost like sort of level somebody or 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 fake somebody into thinking you're all in when you just held a chip back and then get a penalty put on them after the hand. That doesn't seem right. Yeah, I, I do understand what you mean. And an, an actual example of that happening at, happening at the Irish Open, I think, was the final two tables last year where Eugene Barbaros does it against Benny Glasser, where I think Glasser effectively shoves, leaving maybe half a big blind, a big blind behind. And, you know, Eugene says, oh, yeah, you know, well, I have to call and calls and goes to the table his hand and everyone has to say, hold on, hold on, because he's still just still obviously action and play. Uh, the hands weren't exposed, but that that's a perfect example of what you're talking about. Uh, I didn't hear about that. So obviously we were doing commentary at the time and I did hear that Aiden did bag up about, I think it was six or seven big blinds, but I didn't hear the actual story until afterwards. I, I do understand what Dara's saying as well in terms of the ruling is a bit harsh because yeah, I, I guess I'm by no means a TD or a floor person and uh, don't have experience being a TD, but you can understand that there's not a lot of benefits here for, for Aiden, right? Like there's, it's maybe you kind of mentioned the collusionary aspect of trying to encourage some soft play, but then again, 
the player has also three bet to nine big blinds, which is a huge portion of your stack. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, to say it would be collusion would be quite strange. Like, it's effectively 75% of Aiden's stack, and he did get a bit flustered in the moment. Um, and it seems almost harsh that, in what's without being harsh, what's likely to be one of the biggest spots of Aiden's poker career is now hugely punished. Um, especially with the tree hand penalty. And I think I'm not 100% sure. I think he also missed the blinds on. Uh... Yeah, no, you're spot on actually. The And and that was a big part of the reasoning why he, he escalated as much as he did was he was aware that he would be in the blinds, that two of the yeah. hands would be blinds hands and he, he would effectively lose, you know, what, a third of a stack or whatever it would be. Yeah, exactly. Like incredibly painful when it's literally at that stage in the tournament, final two tables, I think 14 people left. I think Aiden Buston 14th. Uh, like those big blinds are literally worth money amounts right we we can literally do an equation to see what these big blinds are worth and you know sitting out for two of them and i think also the small blind is just a, a huge blow to your stack especially a six or seven big blind stack so absolutely well one more thing uh one more quote if you like uh, from aiden before we move on he said it is a rule and i think it should maybe be re- revised or more clarity established around the endless dynamics to which it could happen innocently i would however like to say that while I disagree that a normal penalty in this particular case was warranted, and I even think a three-hand penalty was excessive, I do respect the demeanour in which Sean and Brandon communicate their ruling and rationale. Well, we would expect nothing less from two great TDs such as those guys. Yeah. Um, okay. Just before we move on from that, I spoke to a number of other TDs, and they all said they would have made exactly the same ruling. So, so, so the rule is clear, unfortunately. I th- yeah. and, and 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 there isn't really any provision for discretion within that rule. So I, I think any any t, any competent TB, TD would have made the same ruling. It's just, it's unfortunate because I think and if you understand poker well, you would understand that there was no way this was done to gain an edge. And as I said, there were other cases which just did, you know, in, in, in a tournament as large as the Irish Open just didn't catch their eye. Yeah, absolutely. Well, from one ruling to another, I actually was right in the thick of this one, a bit of a weird one at the Battle of Malta last Saturday. In a nutshell, I arrived for level four of the tournament and within two to three hands, somebody pointed out that a card was marked. Not a super rare thing at the poker table, but immediately the table got really riled up because this was apparently the fourth time it had happened in the previous you know hour and a half or whatever it was before I got there. Floor staff replacing the deck were understandably annoyed and issued a warning to the table over the course of the next 90 minutes. There were three further incidences of, you know, cards being marked and other players spotting it at one time or another. And it's fair to say that the players were getting really suspicious of each other. In fact, even like people sort of leveling the suspicion, like, going, well, is it the guy who complained about the last one? Because that's exactly what you might do to defer. You know, it was just it was creating a horrible atmosphere, as you could imagine, at the table. Um. Also, the floor staff were really irate. They'd gone through seven decks of cards for us in three hours. Um, so they put a dealer on the table who was going to pull in every you know set of cards really slowly, really carefully, watch all the players like a hawk, instructed to slow down the game at our table so they could do that because basically enough was enough in their mind. In fact, I think probably it had gone on too long already. Lo and behold, and this was kind of mad, really, when you consider how much scrutiny was being put on us, within two hands, the offender was caught red-handed, again marking an ace. All previous times, it was kings and aces that were marked in the deck. The table was pretty pissed off, as you can imagine. I made jokes about the rule being that we should all get to punch the guy in the face at the break. Uh, He did plead his innocence in Italian, which the guy beside me translated as something along the lines of him saying, it's impossible for me not to mark these puny cards with my giant manly hands. Um, Funny that, it, though, it was only kings and aces that his giant manly hands and muscular fingers had marked. Uh, anyway, before I tell you what the ruling was, and also give you guys the rulings as would be from two very famous uh, tournament directors, as I sent this one to them as well, what do you think it should have been? Tom, go first this time. Okay, this will be tough because I'm... Again, not familiar with typical TD rulings and what seems reasonable and what seems unreasonable. But like, for someone to be caught, I, I guess red-handed marking cards, which to be fair is a complete breach in uh, game integrity and, in my opinion, one hundred percent cheating. Like something like this warrants like, I'm unsure about like how many hand penalties or whatever you sit out for a round or two rounds or three rounds or whatever. But like, surely it, it's more long-lasting than that, right? Like your name should almost be marked you know when you're going to other events or like almost kind of black hearted so that they're aware that this person has got up to suspicion such as this before like uh pretty wild to me yeah i'm I'm not too familiar with these scenarios but 
Well, your analysis is pretty good for someone who isn't. I, I give you credit on that. Daryl, what would you have done as TD? Obviously, he was only caught red-handed this one time, but pretty damning for him. It was exactly the same mark on exactly the same part of the card as every previous other time. Yeah, well, first of all, I'm not a TD. And one of the things that really annoys me uh, as an ex-referee is how they only ever have footballers commenting about refereeing decisions <laughs> on football coverage and they, and, and they never ask referees. So I so I feel like the equivalent of the of the dumb footballer who's headed the ball too often uh, and now being asked to, <laughs> to discuss the nuance of the rules. Like Tom, no idea what the TD rules are. But in my mind, it's fairly clear cut. I mean, assuming that, that there's little doubt that, that the guy was cheating, then surely it has to be disqualification. You just can't. Yeah, that goes with my implication as well. Sorry, that it, it would have to be solid, right? It would have to be 100% evidence that yes, this player has certainly marked cards, maybe even multiple examples at other events rather than just immediately going to, you know, mark this player. But yeah, the only sort of mitigating factor is I, I think actually the decks of cards we're using in this festival are kind of not as great quality. Um, and, and some. It's not even necessarily the quality, although it often is, that some cards are more markable than others. Some cards really don't survive the, you know, pinch up that people do. Um, people sweat cards and can mark cards just because of the way they sweat them. Um, good cards obviously should bounce back quite nicely, but you know, it is the case sometimes that they don't. So, but but I don't want to give this guy too much, you know, mitigating factors because I do think it was pretty dirty. In the end, he was pulled aside from the table by the head floor who gave him a really stern talking to in Italian. Uh, I don't speak Italian, but they seem to be really getting into it on the side. Um, not sure quite what, quite what was said, but the ruling in the end was he was given a one orbit penalty, which I thought was very um, lenient, actually. I, 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 I unfortunately was not there. The one orbit penalty took us past the break and I actually bust. So I didn't see him come back. I was would have been interested to see what the table thought of him, what the dynamics were with him back whether, you know, special dealers were, were kept on us to, you know, monitor what he was doing. I, I I assume they were watching him like a hawk after that. I reached out to Nick O'Hara with this one because, you know, I rate Nick as one of the best and I was curious what he would do. He said, if I can prove 100% he was purposely marking kings and aces, then I'll disqualify him instantly. It is very difficult to prove this, though, unless he admits it. However, if he has definitely been caught marking at least one card, then I'll give him a three round penalty straight away and I'll tell him the next offense is disqualification. And I will also, in that instance, ban him from all future events. I'll also instruct the dealer to examine his cards every time he folds them. Next time he's caught, he is gone forever. I also reached out to Matt Savage, who actually said he would throw him out immediately, saying it was important in his mind to make an example out of people who mark cards like this. And I have to say, I kind of like both rulings. I like the idea of putting the guy on last chance, and I like the idea of making an example of him. Uh, your thoughts on what the guy said there, Tom? Yeah, no, 100% agree. Uh, like, stuff like this can't be tolerated whatsoever, again, for game integrity reasons. Um, and also, users suffering the effects of... I, I do think the actual uh, penalty given out is way too lenient, right? One round. Also, because right. these are suffering the effects of time, right? Like, they're putting a dealer on the table that has to examine every card now. Things are slowing down. These are all suffering the repercussions of this, and he's getting away with as light as a one-round penalty. And definitely, I think, as you are saying, Matt said, an example should be made. I I don't completely... Like, again, you'd have to 100% to pr prove it and yeah. say that he is marking aces and kings. But if you could confirm that, like, I, I don't uh, object to disqualification, right? Like, it seems completely reasonable to me. And Dara, as the uh, somewhat concussed footballer uh, who's headed the ball too many times, uh, I mean, my takeaway from this is you 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 just admitted that you uh, you you bust. So I I assume you were storing your balls off, and I'm I'm going to start a conspiracy <laughs> theory now that you were in cahoots with this Italian, uh, and, and the whole thing was your latest elaborate stalling uh, mechanism to, uh, to 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 somehow get across the line. Yeah, I mean. Uh, the problem I, was is, I was stalling in level five. I, was yeah. I, well, I realized they've spotted when I stall in level 13, they know what I'm at. So I start stalling in level five now. But, uh, yeah, I mean, the problem again is, 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 is just burden of proof. It's very difficult to prove that somebody's doing it. I mean, even if they're on the same part of the card, that's not really conclusive because people tend to peel their cards the same way. So it could be just that the way that they're peeling it is marking that part of the card. I think there's a there's an onus on organizers to use high quality cards. Um, I don't, I, I don't think these flimsy little cards should should ever be used. Um, former guest Mason Malmuth had written quite a bit on exactly what brands should be used and why. Um, 
I think that's organizers something organizers need to take on board. But yeah, yeah, I I think so long as you're reasonably sure that the guy uh, has done it, then I I completely agree with both Nick and uh, and Matt that disqualification should be done. Like you can't really play with a player that you don't trust at the table. That the whole thing sort of breaks down. Yeah. Well, last story of the week. This day last week, in fact, Poker OK, a Russian skin of GG Poker, made the decision to ban stables. Uh, the CEO of Poker OK said he was acting with the knowledge and consent of GG Poker's owners, asserting that GG Poker is and always intended for amateur players. Um, is and was, I should say. Posting under the name Donk vs. Fish on the Russian Gypsy Poker Forum, the Poker OK CEO said... There will be no more negotiations. Stables are prohibited from playing poker, period. Take the money and get out. If you come back, we will find you and the measures will be stricter. Later adding, this applies to both the game and any marketing manifestations, including the advertising of stables from streamers who cooperate with Poker OK, promotion on social networks, advertising in the media and publications about the successes and winnings of your players. You must not play on Poker OK and must not advertise training, playing, or backing on poker, okay? There were also posts in this thread inferring that if you play with a good strategy, you will also be banned with confiscation, and that the network basically just wants a room full of amateurs. Dara, there's a couple of things to unpack in all of this. Firstly, let's look at the broad stroke sentiment that GG don't want winning players. Uh, I tweeted this week how winning players are a crucial part of poker's USP and that this was a dangerous line to take reminiscent actually of a my era poker stars gg seem to have already adopted daniel negranu's more is better approach does it now look like they're going to adopt his infamous fuck the pros sentiment too um i think it's probably too early to say like this this was a russian skin and the, the whole russian market is quite problematic um you know a lot of the rta tools that, that, that we see advertised um are you know they they come from that from that particular market? It's sometimes stuff is lost in translation too. So you know when when the guy said, for example, no training, did he actually say no training or did he say no RTA? That's uh, the, the, there's there's kind of a subtle difference there. Sure. You you are completely right that obviously um, amateurs make up most of a healthy ecosystem, and you know our our, our sponsors Unibet they don't ban stables, but they don't encourage them. Um, and they very much encourage recreationals as much as possible. Uh, so it's it's kind of a similar sentiment, but but expressed differently. Let's say it, the, the 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 emphasis is on um, encouraging rec- as many recreational players to play as possible, rather than banning stables per se. Uh, stables are have always been problematic. Um, it's it's you know th- there's there's a difficult there's a, a complicated relationship between a lot of sites and stables. Um, they they obviously welcome the liquidity that the stable provides, and several tournaments on stars died because the stables effectively pulled out. Uh, they, they they decided that this tournament isn't isn't worth it anymore. But at the same time, you know, if a site has too many of too many stables operating relative to the to to the, to the pool, then it completely um, dilutes the whole thing, and and the whole site doesn't prosper. I would argue that that's essentially what happened at Party Poker. Uh, after they started going for the Maya era, they 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 made they made large efforts to get as many uh, pros and regs across as possible, and they encouraged stables across, and ultimately that it just became the toughest site as a result, and then the whole thing sort of imploded. So it's a very it, it's a very delicate um, balance, but you but I agree with you completely. You, you you never want to get away from the idea that you can win at poker, um, even if it's becoming more and more difficult to do so, because that that is a unique selling point of poker. It's not like all the other stuff that the gambling operators operate, where the where, where the house always wins. A lot of people go into poker, and pretty much almost everybody starts as a losing player. But they have to have that idea that if they work hard and they really apply themselves, they can uh, become winning players and um and, and and maybe even make their living from it. And that's not just something for pros. Incidentally, recreationals also need to feel the same. I coach a lot of recreationals who are winning players. That's very important to them. They will stop playing if if the game becomes unbeatable because they're not going to keep banging their head off a off a brick wall. So it is the unique selling point of poker that this is a game you can win at, and it's actually good for the ecosystem that there are winning players. You you just you just don't want you you want to maintain the balance basically. 
Very well said. Turning to you, Thomas, in my opinion, stables are almost part of the natural evolution of the game. Now, are there stables that behave unethically? Yes, I think there are. There's actually probably quite a few. And should measures be taken against those stables or stable mates who collude or soft play or cooperate in any way? Absolutely, they should all be snap banned, in my opinion. Is it right, though, to ban all stables, especially, though, because... The sites have made the game tougher and tougher to beat over the years. Faster structures, higher rake, adding variants and lottery elements like mystery bounties and spins. Many players who are trying to cut their teeth, trying to actually make a living from the game, trying to break in, really rely on the backing of stables to stay in the game to help them ride out the variants. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's a bit of a strange dynamic, right? Like, it it also kind of becomes a I say they say type of situation as well, right? So like let's say if the whole of GG adopts this uh, situation where they say no stables are allowed, then it also becomes into the the situation where, well, how can you prove I'm in such and such stable? How can you prove that I'm a professional player? Maybe I'm a recreational player and I'm unbelievably winning, right? So like certainly if this is the approach and this is adopted, what are the metrics that we're going to define that? Okay, well he's he's a professional player, he's crushing it, we're going to ban him from GG, or he's in such and such stable, and we've banned all stables. Uh, it, it seems kind of strange. Like it, th Then let's imagine a world where all stables are removed, and we do identify everyone that's in a stable, and now we're just left with recreational players on G GG. Then it's just going to become the, the, the natural order, where there's going to be slightly more winning wrecks than others, um, and eventually they'll filter to, I guess, the top. The cream rises to the top, as they say. The better wrecks will filter to the top. Now, what happens here? Are these considered professional players? Like, are, will these be removed from the pool because they're so much winning or there's a, a metric that they're going over that they're defined as now professional? So it's kind of strange. Um, again, uh, as you have stated, you are probably a lot more familiar with it than me, that stables are crucial to the economy of poker as well, right? And stables are also crucial to some professional players, again, as riding out the high variance of tournament poker. Um myself included potentially looking into some sort of option like that not because uh, you know there's no hope or we we i need to go with a stable but yeah again for that reason of kind of peace of mind having more financial security uh i did read pad's post uh on all the topics about stables and why you know people are also say i, I don't want to be harsh to brazilians here but you always get it on poker stars we're on a final table and there's five brazilians and they're going oh they're on the same stable they're sharing cards there's collusion going on here which Typically, most of the time, doesn't tend to be the case. Um, but he did mention good ways to potentially police stables. And I think this is a much better approach than just saying all professional players will be banned and, you know, all the stables shouldn't be accepted. We just want recreationals. Like, why not implement a team who it obviously can't be one person because I'm assuming there's tons of tables and thousands of players, right? But a team who looks after, okay, like this is such and such stable, we'll monitor these players cl uh, closely. If there is any collusion, well, uh, but we can be aware of this now rather than kind of point fingers and assume and say these players are colluding and we can actually kind of clamp down on this better, which I do think is a much better approach than saying absolutely no pros, no stables, and just taking away what I assume is a large part of the market. Yeah, it's a big sledgehammer approach. I suppose one of the things is uh, GG have the staking built into the site, and I don't know if that's yeah. to encourage more transparent use of that feature. Dara, I, I know you uh, play on GG and are familiar with their software and how it works. I know you're also familiar with what happened with the Maya era poker stars and how that sort of sledgehammer fuck the pros approach actually hurt the company in the end because poker players aren't stupid, actually, and, and they do eventually respond with their feet i think they you know maybe are slow to initially but they i think they do actually vote with their feet in, in a lot of situations yeah i mean essentially what happened in the amaya era stars is amaya were a site who are amaya were a company who really didn't understand poker and, and its unique selling point they were best known for having run another um site uh, another poker online site into the ground before they took over stars they essentially zoomed out and took a macro view of poker and and, and so okay well the way it works is losing players deposit they lose all their money eventually uh, a, a, a small amount of that 10 to 15 percent of that goes to the winning players and the rest goes to the site as rake well we guess what we want that 10 to 15 percent now um mm. uh, we we want it all but tom was completely right like if you take all of the best players out what happens initially is just the next tier down starts winning uh and and now they're your winners but I think Amaya had a long-term plan that they were going to make changes uh, and essentially make the games unbeatable by increasing the rake, 
uh, by making the structures faster and therefore uh, less of a skill edge for the for the better players. Um, the problem with that is that it's not just that the winning players don't win anymore. It's that the losing players lose faster uh, and have a generally worse experience. And that's essentially what happened to my is, um, era stars. Everybody's just experienced the stars degraded. And uh, initially they tried to present it um, via their loyal mouthpiece, um, Diamond Negreanu, as this will be great for Rex. We'll get rid of all of those those pros who are taking all your money. Uh, but actually what happened is the, 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 the Rex ended up losing their money even faster. Um, and as you say, people did eventually figure that out, uh, if, if for no other reason that they were depositing faster and and the money was disappearing. So that's it's it's, it's kind of ironic that Negreanu is now the, the main sponsor for GG. If GG do take that route, they've obviously got the perfect man for the job uh, to try and once again convince us all that more rake is better and that it's that it's great for, for recreationals. The thing is, I think recreationals are not as stupid as as the poker sites think, and most of them realize what this is. This is this is a pure money grab if it ever happens. Yeah, and it sort of smacks of that sort of monopolistic practices that we felt Amaya were doing when they took a company that had a seventy percent share of the market. Obviously, GG aren't quite up to that number yet, but they are in the lead, if you like, in terms of market share, and I suppose starting to show signs of how they're going to exploit that fact. Um, if you want to read the excellent breakdown of this, I would encourage you to check out the uh, piece just mentioned there by Thomas uh, Patrick Leonard's long tweet from a few days ago. I thought it was very well balanced take, actually. You know, Patrick obviously is experienced uh, on the other side, having a stable, but also understands, you know, what ethical stables can do, what unethical stables might be doing and, you know, what's possible. And he sort of lays it all out very nicely. Um, on the subject of big stables, I was actually going to reiterate something Dara said there as well. Um, what I would say is I do like how Unibet have acted on this. In the past, I know for a fact they've been approached by stables who've offered their players on the condition of favourable rake-back deals. That's normally the way stables kind of go in. In fact, the way it works is they'd sort of uh, send their players in there for like a fortnight and a sample size and then go to the head of poker or whatever and say, have you noticed how your, let's say for argument's sake, spin and goes are much doing much better this last fortnight and the high rake that you've gotten and blah, blah, blah. And the person will go, oh yeah, it does look like we've, you know, spiked up in the last few weeks. Well, that's all my guys in there. I'll keep them playing, uh, but you have to give us like 80% rake back or whatever it would be. And, uh, you know, when that's happened and it's happened more than once to Unibet, uh, we have basically said, no, we don't really want you. We're not going to stop stables and their players from uh, playing on the site, they're welcome to play uh, just like anyone else, but we're not going to incentivize it in any way, shape or form. And uh, that's just not going to happen. Um, so I think that's good. And it actually is a slippery slope, I think, and a precarious decision for sites to make. And I think it is, as Dara said, in evidence with the decline of party poker, who for many years relied on the liquidity brought by stables on hugely favorable rate back deals. And then when they started you know, losing market share and getting smaller, only the stables were left. And then it's almost like they're in this awful situation where they don't know if they should burn the stables who are on, you know, deals that are not really very profitable for the site and they were just there to provide liquidity. And if they pull them out, the schedule might disappear altogether almost. I, I know they've been facing challenges of that nature. So, you know, I, I, you know, it can be really bad for the sites as well. It's not just us looking out for the players. We want the sites to do well, but we want the players to do well and we need it to be a, a balanced ecosystem for it all to work. And if it's not there, then we lose places to play games as well. Anyway, that concludes our chat for today. I'm going to leave you with the news of the Chip Race series on Unibet from the 5th of May till the 12th of May. We're having another Chip Race branded online series on Unibet Poker. This was a massive success last year. So we expected to smash the 200k guarantee. It will be 26 events across eight nights, ranging in buy-ins from 25 euros to 100 euros. There's a leaderboard attached, as always, uh, 8k in added money via 6k in the leaderboard and a 2k winners showdown free roll for all the champions of each individual event there will also be prizes in the form of dara's books for our unlucky bubble boys and girls across the festival thomas uh not putting you on the spot here but are you going to play that series uh this is actually the first i'm hearing about it so i'll definitely give it a go yeah it sounds great i'm trying to play as uh much unibet as uh, possible lately so Great stuff we love to hear it. and dara are you looking forward to taking a week away from all the live grinding i know you're like basically on course to setting all sorts of Irish records for number of caches. And uh, I know you're top of GPI at the moment and all of that, but you know, your first love is online poker. And in fact, maybe live poker is well down the list. 
Like poker is well down the list. Yeah, it's got, it's it's kind of ironic because uh, when when Barry found out that I was on top of the GPI rankings back in January, he predicted that this would happen. That I would now start trying to <laughs> chase it. And I mean, it's to be honest, I haven't played anything I wouldn't have played anyway. But yeah. um, but yeah, certainly there'll be no retirement from live poker this year as as long as there's any prospect of me finishing on top. But yeah, I, I'm I'm very much looking forward to getting back to online. One of my favorite things always about this time of year is it's just a great time online. Um, all the all the, all the major sites of series um and it's you know it's before the wsop before we go off to the desert to waste our summer playing cards in air conditioned uh, hangars and uh just remembering you know online poker is my first love i was an online player before i was a live player it's still the thing i prefer the most of all the things i do um and the chip race series is always is, is always great fun and uh the only Telling thing about it is when I when I logged on uh, yesterday uh, onto the onto the um, network, I saw your face staring back at me. Oh Jesus! Um, are, are they using are both our images or just mine? No, just you. Just you. Oh, fuck. Is this the image of David looking rather evil when he's kind of looking? Yeah, at that's the one. Yeah, yeah, he looks barrel. yeah, very very evil. <laughs> yeah, I look I, I look like a gay Bond villain. I think in that one. <laughs> yeah. Um. Anyway, on that note, it remains for me to thank Thomas Murphy. Yeah, cheers. Thanks very much for having me on, guys. This is a ton of fun. So Really appreciate your uh, comments and insights. And Tara O'Carney, of course, thank you very much. Thank you, David. Fun as always. And um, I'll be seeing you in Malta soon. Yes, of course. We have the Malta Poker Festival coming up in just a couple of weeks, which uh, Unibet are, or Unibet DSO specifically are sponsoring the main event. Dara is going to come here. So we might even do a lock-in from here together. Would that be nice? In theory. In theory, that would be nice. <laughs> On that note, good night, everyone.